Uh, my name is Jacob Rohrm. I'm one of the public programs associates here at the History Center. And I'm really glad you came out here on a Thursday night. It's a little quiet. It's a little, uh, we're new to Thursday evenings being open, so thanks for making your way out here. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the night, tonight's talk. And uh, as you can probably uh, know, as you probably know, few characters have commanded such devoted attention and fascination and love like Sherlock has for so long. So I'm excited uh, to introduce our speaker who will be talking about Sherlock fandom through the ages. But before we begin, a couple housekeeping items. If you need to use the restroom, out that rotunda and turn left, it's back there. If you have any noisemakers, make sure those are silenced. Um, you got a survey on your way in. If you could fill that out on your way out, we would love that. It's got two sides. It's really helpful for us to know what are we doing well, what kind of programs you, the public, really enjoy. So you can drop that off on the table and you can also enter in your name into the fishbowl for a chance to win the $25 gift certificate to our bookstores. Uh, you can use it here. You can also use it at any of our bookstores at our sites, Split Rock, Mill Axe, wherever you may be. Um, I'd also like to remind you tonight that we're gathered here on the ancestral and contemporary homelands of the Dakota people. And that the Minnesota Historical Society shares, uh, we have 26 sites around the state. We share our geography with 11 Dakota and Anishinaabe nations. And I'd encourage you to learn more about the history of the land that you may call home and seek out ways to support our indigenous uh, neighbors and, and nations. And uh, I can recommend our exhibit upstairs, Our Home Native Minnesota, is a good starting point. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Anne McClellan is a professor of English at Plymouth State University in New Hampshire and an internationally known scholar in 20th century British literature and culture, Sherlock Holmes and fan studies. She is the author of How British Women Writers Transform the Campus Novel and numerous articles on topics related to British literature and Sherlock Holmes. Her publications on Sherlock Holmes show a wide range of approaches to better understand the leg legacy and iterability of the Sherlock stories. In just my quick perusal, they include the role of Titbits Magazine in the cultivation of early Sherlock fandom, Philip Brogdon, the first black American member of the Baker Street Irregulars, different race-bent black American versions of Sherlock in the early 20th century, BBC's Sherlock and its multiple uses of text, BBC Sherlock and its use of role playing via social media, gender swapping and Sherlock fan fiction, and her latest book, Sherlock's World, fan fiction and reimagining of BBC's Sherlock. Um, in it, McClellan takes seriously the immensely popular world of fan fiction inspired by the popular BBC show Sherlock, exploring the tension between adaptation and source text, the blurry boundaries between canon, genre, character, and reality, it's an in-depth exploration of one of the newest incarnations of Sherlock fandom. I encourage you to take a look if you have the chance. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Anne McClellan to Minnesota. Thank you so much and thank you for the wonderful invitation to join you here in Minnesota at the Minnesota Historical Society. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the history and popularity, of course, of Sherlock Holmes, really from his inception all the way through con contemporary iterations. And since we kind of have a lot to go over today, I did give you an outline um, of what we're gonna do. So we're gonna very briefly talk about the origins of Sherlock Holmes, a little bit on the publication history. You can learn a lot about that at the exhibit upstairs if you haven't had a chance to check it out just yet. We're gonna talk about early fan fascination in the 1890s. Um, jump ahead a little bit to the 30s and the Sherlock Holmes societies that started around that time period. Jumping to the 50s and the Festival of Britain and kind of the rise of some fan tourism. And then we're gonna look at kind of contemporary culture and different ways that fans participate in Sherlock fandom in the contemporary environment. So of course, you know, we're starting with the man himself, right? Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, born in 1859 in Edinburgh, Scotland, to a mostly middle class to upper middle class family. His father was a successful illustrator, but unfortunately he suffered from alcoholism and had to be institutionalized during Doyle's lifetime. And it was really thanks um, to his maternal uncle that he was able to get the kind of education that he did. He graduated from the University of Edinburgh Medical School 
1881, and like many a college graduate, thought he might want to have a few adventures before he had to settle down and work for the rest of his life. So he signed up to be a ship's surgeon, and he sailed to the Arctic in 1881 for about four to six months. And he thought that was such an exciting adventure that as soon as he came back, he jumped on another ship and he sailed down to the west coast of Africa before finally returning to England and setting up his first medical practice down in Portsmouth, England. Now, lucky for us, but maybe unlucky for him, he wasn't a very good doctor. So he couldn't get any patients to come in and see him and he couldn't pay any of his bills. So he decided to um, return and revisit to a hobby that he had while he was in university of writing short stories and selling them for money. And of course, this is where most of him, us know him as the creator of, of Sherlock Holmes uh, and John Watson. Over his career, he published 56 short stories and four novellas featuring Holmes and Watson. But a lot of people don't know that he also authored more than 20 other novels. He really wanted to be known as a historical fiction writer. Um, he also wrote some adventure fiction and more than 100 other original short stories before he died in 1930 of a heart attack. At the time of his death, Arthur Conan Doyle was the highest paid writer in the entire world, thanks to the success of Sherlock Holmes. Now, the first Sherlock Holmes story was A Study in Scarlet, published in 1887 in a Beaton's Christmas Annual, and it was super exciting earlier today when I went upstairs and actually saw one of those Beaton's Christmas Annuals um, upstairs in the exhibit. Um, it didn't get a lot of public attention or press. A couple years later, he published The Sign of Four, or The Sign of the Four, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. And again, it really didn't get a lot of critical attention. It wasn't until Doyle started publishing in the Strand magazine, his short stories in 1891, that Sherlock Holmes really became a global phenomenon. And I talk about this because you know, there's some elements there that um, are key to the short story cycles that he wrote, that he didn't come to the public's attention right away. People weren't enamored of this particular character until he really starts kind of locking in these episodic stories that you can read um, throughout in um, the Strand Magazine. He continues writing um, the stories. Um, in 1893, he's making good money. He's incredibly successful. And he starts writing to his friends and family. And he says, you know, I'm just really kind of getting sick and tired of writing about this Sherlock Holmes guy. Nobody's taking me seriously. I want to be considered a serious novelist. So he starts writing people that he's going to kill Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> And everybody said, don't do it. This is a big mistake. His mother writes him and says, please don't do it. Like any mother would, right? You're finally getting an income. His editors at the Strand said, we've got a good thing going. Please don't do this. He says, you know, he can't stand it. Um, and so he's going to go ahead um, and, and kill him off. And we're going to talk a little bit about what happens there. So Doyle takes a break from writing the Sherlock Holmes stories from about 1893 until about 1901, where he's persuaded to come back for you know, what he thought was a one-off. He was going to you know, go back and write one more Sherlock Holmes stories, and then people, just to make a little cash and get people off of his back. And he ends up um, serializing and then publishing The Hound of the Baskervilles, probably the most famous um, Sherlock Holmes story um, that is known um, all over the world these days. He's so successful with that that now the publishers won't leave him alone. So um, Collier's Magazine in the United States starts offering him thousands of dollars for more and more, more money. He says, no, $10,000, no, $15,000, no, $25,000 for 13 stories, no. They finally get up to $45,000 for a dozen more Sherlock Holmes stories. The Strand Magazine over in London says, and we'll you know, jump on that, and we'll pay you an extra 100 pounds for every 1,000 words you write. And he said, sold. <laughs> and he brings Sherlock Holmes back to life and continues writing the short stories all the way till 1927. So The Adventure of Shostakovich Old Place is the last Sherlock Holmes story that's published before um, Doyle dies um, in 1930 of a heart attack. Now, kind of with that quick, you know, lightning quick kind of overview, what we see early on, and, and I taught that bit about um, the study in Scarlet and the sign of four, and people not really liking those stories or paying much attention to them, to really offset those Strand Magazine short stories when they start. 
Because what starts to happen in the 1890s is that we start to see the public engaging with Sherlock Holmes as a character in ways that were very unique and we had not seen th um, that way in kind of literary history before. So all the way in the 1890s, you know, before Holmes publishes um, the final problem in 1893 where he kills Sherlock Holmes off, we've got people writing into newspapers and magazines asking in particular if Sherlock Holmes is a real person. So this boundary between the fictional character and reality starts getting blurred with Sherlock Holmes very early on. And this is kind of one of those unique elements with the fandom, with this character that you don't see with other fictional characters. So you can see people were writing into newspapers like Titbits, which was a sister um, newspaper that went with same editors as the Strand magazine. Buttons wishes to know whether Sherlock Holmes, a detective genius, is or is not an actual person. There's even a survey in the um, late uh, 1990s, I believe, in England that 30% of the people surveyed were still believed that Sherlock Holmes was a real historical character. <laughs> so there's people still today that believe that as well. Um, so, of course, they continue, and then they try to figure out his paternity very early on. You know, is he the son of Oliver Wendell Holmes? You know, where's his family? Um, the newspapers played along with this and encouraged this as well. So you've got newspapers publishing real-life interviews with Sherlock Holmes in the 1890s as well. So the National Observer, you know, claims that they sent a reporter to 221B Baker Street um, in 1892 to interview Sherlock Holmes, um, where he basically says that Conan Doyle is a plagiarist, <laughs> he's stolen my life, he's a terrible writer, he doesn't have any creativity, why can't he come up with his own ideas? Um, and then in the Bookman, also in the United States, um, Arthur Bartlett Maurice um, claims to have traveled to London to interview Sherlock Holmes um, in his um, rooms in Upper Baker Street as well. And so you have these kind of news media playing into this um, belief and creating what um, historian Michael Saylor calls naive believers, people who want to believe that Sherlock Holmes is a real person. And this starts very early on while, while Doyle is really still crafting his character. The newspapers as well, kind of even going into the 20th century, continue to kind of build and lean heavily into this naive belief of Holmes as a real person. So um, Reginald Pound, who was a historian of the Strand Magazine and its history, reports in his book that a Paris newspaper, which was reporting on a crime, um, printed an imaginary interview with Sherlock Holmes, which of course upset the Paris police, because <laughs> they said this is not helping us, right, really solve our crime at, at, uh, um, at all. So now they said, now we've got kind of Holmes mania over in Paris. Um, and then in, in World War I, the, the London Times reported that the Turks suspected uh, the great English detective Sherlock Holmes was working as a spy <laughs> for the British government um, and operating in Asia Minor during um, the war and right after the war um, on part of the British government and the British Secret Service. So these newspapers kind of leaned into this naive belief very early on and all the way through early 20th century of convincing audiences that Holmes was a real person and that he was you know, possibly um, interacting in world and environments all the way around us. One of the other um, elements that really kind of um, helped foster this naive belief in Holmes realism um, is the role of advertising also with Sherlock Holmes. So even in the early 1890s with the rise of kind of mass media advertising in magazines and in newspapers, um, advertisers were already recognizing the power and capability of using celebrity and public media figures in order to sell their materials. And it's fascinating to see that as early as 1892, Sherlock Holmes becomes kind of an inadvertent spokesperson for a medical um, advertisement, for Beecham's Pills. And there's a couple of these different advertisements um, in different archives where Holmes is talking to Watson or they're having a conversation where he gives a plug for Beecham's Pills. And this is one of my favorite ones. Um, this is from the Wellcome Library because it, it looks like a real telegram. And so basically kind of there's this, this setup here, you know, um, that it says, you know, yes, it had gone, when and how no one could fathom. Evidently, the only thing to be done was to call in my friend Sherlock Holmes. And so you have this in the paper as well, this fake um, handwritten telegram for um, Watson, um, 
telegraphing Sherlock Holmes, saying, you know, come immediately in great distress, um, box and valuable contents missing, no clue, and he's missing his Beecham's pills. There's another great example of um, Holmes is out on a case and he wires back to Watson and says, I've forgotten my, basically, you know, Beecham's pills like your aspirin, please bring them to me immediately so I continue working. So he gets involved in kind of cross promotion and advertising very early on as well. And even their kind of verisimilitude of the advertising in the newspapers keeps that belief going that Holmes is a real person and interacting in the um, contemporary world as well. Now, I mentioned um, earlier already that Holmes decided pretty quickly, about you know, five or six years into writing the Sherlock Holmes stories, that he wanted to kill Sherlock Holmes off and to um, dedicate himself to what he called serious fiction. He wanted to be a historical novelist. Um, so in 1893, he publishes um, the very famous story, The Final Problem. Excuse me. In that story, you know, Holmes meets his arch nemesis, Professor Moriarty. They have this, you know, legendary confrontation at the Reichenbach waterfall in Switzerland, and unfortunately, Holmes and Moriarty fall to their death. When this story came out, uh, people lost their minds. I'm just going to say that. So you had people, legends say, young men were wearing black armbands around their sleeves and on their hats um, to mourn the death of a fictional character. We have hundreds of letters of hate mail came to Arthur Conan Doyle blaming him for killing off Sherlock Holmes and demanding that he be brought back to life. Holmes, um, Watson, him, uh, Holmes and Watson, Doyle himself, yeah, he plays into this too. I am not even talk about that part. Um, he responded to fan mail um, with his with Sherlock Holmes' name. Um, so much uh, hate mail, and he even was attacked in the street. He was hit over the head by a, a little old lady and called a brute. Um, and but probably the most shocking statistic that the Strand magazine, more than one thousand subscribers canceled their subscription to the magazine in protest. And hundreds more um, wrote letters and demanded that Doyle bring Sherlock Holmes um, back to life. So nobody had ever seen this kind of response to a fictional character before. And this kind of, even just Doyle's personal interactions are not the only thing that starts happening at this magical moment in 1893. In fact, what starts happening in newspapers is that we start to see ads like this. What does this look like to you? an obituary, right? So this is actually from a Welsh newspaper called the Western Mail. It came out in December of 1893, and it says, you know, the late Sherlock Holmes. A correspondent writes, Sherlock Holmes is no more. He dies with his name ringing in men's ears. The police of the world are left with their inferior resources as of old, right? And, um, and in the new number of the Strand Magazine, the career of this, the most wonderful detective, amateur or otherwise, known to fiction, is brought to an end. How, of course, it would be unfair to say. And they end by saying, you know, Sherlock Holmes will not be forgotten by this generation, at least. This is not the only fake obituary that came out in 1893 and 1894. This one came out in, in Wales. There was another one in Leeds. There's another one that comes out even in Harper's in the United States. That one's so long, I tried to put it on a slide for you, and it would take me two slides <laughs> to be able to get it. And all of them start off with this very sad lament that um, Sherlock Holmes has perished. People wrote into um, magazines and newspapers and you know, complaining to the editors of Titbits, and Titbits is trying to defend themselves. They say, we pleaded for Holmes's life, right? Uh, you know, we feel as if we'd lost an old friend because Arthur Conan Doyle had decided he didn't want to write these stories anymore. So there's a huge sense of, of loss and lament for the death of a fictional character, which we'd never seen. Even when J.K. Rowling kills off Dumbledore and Harry Potter, you never saw this kind of public reaction to the death of a fictional character like we have with Sherlock Holmes in this case. And so it's unusual and unheard of in literary fiction. Except in Sherlock Holmes's case, 
it happened again. <laughs> so in 2012, the BBC Sherlock, you know, aired their second season of their new kind of modern day Sherlock Holmes, and they decided to finalize their third episode of that season by doing an adaptation of The Final Problem. Uh, many of you have probably, you know, um, watched that episode. Moriarty has convinced the world that Sherlock Holmes is fake and he has been hired. Moriarty's an actor who's been hired. Um, and so Sherlock Holmes's reputation is basically being dis besmirched, and Moriarty um, basically blackmails him into killing himself. When that episode aired um, in 2012, the world again lost their minds, right? So you had all of these people writing on Twitter and lamenting the death of Sherlock Holmes as this character, even though the creator said, we're really surprised that anyone was shocked by the ending since, you know, spoiler alert, it was, came out 120 years ago. We all know how this one's going to go. Um, but this one particular fan kind of wrote um, on the internet a you know, very similar kind of tale that we saw back in 1893. So um, this fan, um, Earl Foolish, said, so, you know, I guess you've all heard slash read slash seen the news. It's been pretty hard to miss it, the death of Sherlock Holmes. I'm gutted, but I'm doing my best to keep it together. I don't know about you guys, but I refuse to believe it, that he was a fraud. He just can't have been, can't have. I saw him at a crime scene once, right? I'd followed the sound of sirens and hope it'd be one of his cases, and there is no way he was a fake. You can't make that sort of shit up. He was too good. He was an inspiration for all of us to be more observant in our everyday lives, and I won't accept the so-called truth about Sherlock that's all over the media. I know you feel like I do, and now it's our turn to show that we haven't lost faith in him. Sherlock might be gone, but I won't sit silent, and they did hashtag believe in Sherlock. This hashtag in 2012 became one of the top trending hashtags in Twitter, and fans all over the world started these fan movements trying to share the Believe in Sherlock or I Believe hashtag all over with different kinds of kind of guerrilla installations that you saw. People made flyers and, and put them on, you know, post boxes and in Australia. You had people who made um, buttons and stickers and signs, you know, I believe in Sherlock Holmes, Moriarty was real, I fight John Watson's war. They got together for different organizations. They were in Germany, they were in Australia, they were in South Africa, they were in the United States and Canada. All over, people protesting again, the death of a fictional character, right? So this type kind of, of fan engagement and, you know, sailor term of, of naive belief in Sherlock not only started, you know, during the very first run of those short stories back in the 1890s, but continues to this day, even when people allegedly already know how those stories end. So it's a really kind of fascinating to start and that gives us some hints of how fans have identified with and associated Sherlock Holmes. Now, one of the other elements that we tend to think of as a contemporary part of fandom is that um, the Sherlock Holmes world has an association with early fan fiction as well. So after Doyle published that final problem story in 1893, um, we've talked about kind of the laments that went on, but even uh, titbits ran a prize, even a memorial prize, to try to get audiences to write in and share their favorite Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, and then, you know, they'll, the ones with the best reasoning and the best reasons why would be able to go ahead and win the prize. And this starts a um, kind of, you know, public interaction between the media and the contemporary fans in the 1890s that builds this relationship and starts breaking down boundaries between amateurs and professionals, um, particularly in kind of um, fan fiction as well. So, you know, they start publishing and soliciting pastiches and parodies written by fans and go ahead and to um, submit them for contests and different kinds of activities that they can do. Um, to try to get engagement um, and continued participation and people to come back the next week and buy another issue. This happens a lot in Titbits, which I remember it, I mentioned is the sister um, newspaper to the Strand Magazine, which is where Doyle published in the UK. This is also happening in the United States with, with newspapers and periodicals like The Bookman, who are having editors engage directly with fan mail that's coming in, editorials coming in, 
um, interpretations about the different kinds of stories. And so there's a list, you know, even just during that time when Doyle was not writing, of all different kinds of pastiches that get published and that are prize winning as well. So while Doyle's off trying to make himself be a, a historical serious novelist, you know, the um, fans will not leave him alone uh, and they will not leave the publications alone. So people are constantly writing in to Titbits magazine and to the Strand magazine to ask for more Sherlock Holmes stories. And this is kind of, you know, they're, they keep trying to respond to them, you know, so they've got somebody who writes in as a pseudonym, Three Castles, comes along with the, another long continued, and the poor, you know, um, Titbits editors are like, and shall we say chronic complaint? They're like, yeah, 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 right? Stop complaining to us, right? Um, against Mr. Conan Doyle that does not give us a, a new series of Sherlock Holmes. Um, they basically say, like, you didn't write a good reason why he should give us one. Um, but they say, you know, we'll hope he'll do it sometime, but, you know, we can't say. And as I mentioned, Doyle was continually pressured by um, audiences and publishers as well until he finally, you know, comes back with the um, uh, Hound of the Baskervilles in 1901-1902. Um, at the end of his life, you know, um, Doyle himself uh, looked back at all of that early fan interaction and, and fan um, engagement, particularly with how the public reacted um, when um, Sherlock Holmes, um, when he killed Sherlock Holmes off. And in 1896, um, he had one of my favorite quotes um, about Sherlock Holmes. He says, I've been much blamed for doing that gentleman to death, but I hold that it was not murder, but justifiable homicide in self-defense. <laughs> For if I had not killed him, he certainly would have killed me. <laughs> so I told my, he's been, you know, attacked by the press and attacked by his fans, and he maintained, you know, over and over that it was the only thing that he could do to kind of keep his sanity and keep on going. So we mentioned, so you know, so early fan interaction, particularly tied in with those short, short stories, kind of really follow Doyle um, right through the 1890s, and then he brings him back. And we talked about, you know, he unfortunately passes away in 1930 of a heart attack. And by that time, as I said, he's the highest paid writer in the world and really does have an international following. So these fans now have to finally come to an acceptance that there's not going to be any more new Sherlock Holmes stories. So what different groups started to do is they created with some of their friends who they knew loved the books as much as they did, they created what they called Keeping Sherlock Holmes Alive Societies. So they would get together with their literate friends and they would share their favorite stories, they would share quotes together, gave each other nicknames um, from the different characters in the stories, would create kind of elaborate tests and games to, to check uh, trivia knowledge. And the most elaborate and kind of famous of these is the Baker Street Irregulars from New York. They're the earliest Sherlock Holmes Society, established in 1934 by Christopher Morley, who was the editor of the Saturday Review. Um, and they started off with a very small group of kind of close friends that they would invite and then created a larger organization. They, um, we'll talk a little bit about kind of the different activities that they do, but one of the things they do, because this is actually a photo from the 1940s, 1947 annual dinner, is that they get together in New York City every year, the weekend of January 6th, to celebrate Sherlock Holmes's birthday. It's a fictional character, right? <laughs> Remember that, right? But they get together, they have toasts to the characters, they have all different kinds of activities, they bring in guest speakers, and this continues on to this day. Um, so that's one of their um, big activities that they have. So they started in 1934. They're by invitation only, also, by the way, um, and you have to take a um, rig rigorous exam. I am not a BSI. I've not been invited yet. Um, so, but I'm open if anybody's in the audience. <laughs> um, the Sherlock Holmes Society of London started um, pretty much very quickly after. I always joke they're much more egalitarian. If you just pay your 50 bucks, you're in, right? They also have a birthday weekend gala every year on January 6th. They have wonderful speakers, and you can go and visit them. There are more than 700 active Sherlock Holmes societies still today worldwide, um, including, you know, we've got some kind of super fun ones. The Sherlock Holmes in Peoria is a very active group. And then, of course, right here, we have the wonderful Norwegian Explorers of Minnesota, which is one of the most active um, and really well-known and respective science societies um, as well. So there are, uh, you know, 
lots of international societies. One of the largest and most active as well is the Japan Sherlock Holmes Club. They have more than 1,000 members involved there. There's a long history of, of fan um, engagement and fascination with Sherlock Holmes in Japan. Some of the earliest translations of Sherlock Holmes stories into Japanese were happening in the 1890s, about 1897. So there's a real fascination with his character, you know, going back to the late 19th century as well. So one thing you might notice, anything that kind of stands out, so this is a photo from the BSI's dinner in 1968. Do you notice any pattern? No women, no women right? It's like, what's going on? This is 1968. There's no women in there. It is exclusively an all-male society. Well, in 1968, some group of college graduates decided that this was a little bit unfair, right? We're right in the middle of second wave feminism, and they picketed and protested their annual dinner and demanded that women should be allowed to participate um, in the Baker Street Irregulars. Um, while they were waiting for that, of course, though, they said, well, we don't have to wait around. We can create our own society. <laughs> so they created their own um, women's only society, Adventuresses of Sherlock Holmes, kind of their pseudonym of Ash. And you know, they basically can give you a little history on their website there in the 60s. They continued um, protesting the event, and women were not invited into the Baker Street Irregulars until 1991, which is when they were finally allowed in. Um, and then, but then even the um, adventuresses of Sherlock Holmes went co-ed a little bit later, right? Um, and now um, and allow men to be part of their membership as well. Um, this is kind of what I like to call kind of traditional fandom, you know, our establishment fandom that goes back to the early history of Sherlock Holmes. A lot of the members are real aficionados of the original Arthur Conan Doyle stories, incredibly knowledgeable about the world of Sherlock Holmes. We also kind of have right now, uh, you know, a parallel kind of world of Sherlock Holmes aficionado and fandom, which looks very different, right? So we looked at, you know, 1968 you know, picture of the Baker Street Irregulars, and it was all men. And if you look at 2015 and look at an annual conference where they call 221B Con, it's a conference, it's almost the exact opposite, right? There's another fandom out there that's going on right now that's dominated primarily with people who identify as women. Definitely have um, some men involved there too, um, but it's a very different kind of um, fandom and engagement that they have going on um, simultaneously. Sometimes those groups interact, but oftentimes they continue kind of to lead separate lives. Now, one of the other things, patterns that we might have looked in there, so we said, okay, look at the Baker Street Irregulars, um, and we said, wow, this, you know, they look like there's all men. Now, this is 1986, women still aren't, you know, allowed there. So is there another pattern that you might notice? They're all white, right? <laughs> yeah, so they're all also white men, except if you look closely, right there in the back, <laughs> there's one person, here's your little close up. So that's actually Philip Brogdon. So Philip Brogdon um, was inducted to the Baker Street Regulars in 1986. He's the first black American to be inducted into the organization. Um, and he was an actor and a writer um, and a bibliophile and a collector. And we're going to talk a little bit about more of that, um, about his particular work and contribution to um, Sherlock Holmes later. You know, their most recent event, um, dinner event from 2021, this is 2020, this is their annual dinner. Women are allowed. They inducted their first person of color in 1986. How far have we come, right? <laughs> You know, I love, but, but their organizers, you know, much, much, you know, here are some of their leads of the organization in a much more diverse representation. So still kind of working on um, whether or not, you know, kind of does the predominance of, of white men in Arthur Conan Doyle fandom um, and expertise in particular as well. It's, it's a very uh, male dominated fandom um, as well. Now, you know, some of the things that Baker Street Irregulars do, you know, is, is they participate in what they call the great game. And so the great game is kind of buying into that naive belief that Sherlock Holmes and John Watson were real people. And part of the fun of the work that they do is they treat them very seriously as real historical figures. You know, Watson was a chronicler who was the one who published. Um, Sherlock Holmes's Mysteries and Adventures, and Baker Street Irregulars and Science Society members 
flesh out kind of the world of Sherlock Holmes and create these, um, I don't want to call them alternative histories, but like real histories that go along with um, some of the, the gaps or the stories or backstories of these characters and these mysteries. So um, they may, for example, publish an article that looks at, you know, what is the history between John Watson's marriages? marriages? How many times was he actually married? Um, one of the ones that I read was this amazing um, article that was a reprint, it said, of uh, ophthalmology medical journal article that John Watson had published in the 1890s in a German medical journal. It was, it was real, <laughs> like, it was real science. Um, and people, you know, theorizing about, like, where did Holmes go to university, and if he did, was he an Oxford or a Cambridge man? What do we know about his family? You know, like, researching into his ancestors, talking about his brother's um, history and work with the government. And so, you know, they created also, uh, you know, this whole kind of world that treats that as, as part of the, the work and the fun that they do. Now, this, some people allege that this really starts about in 1920 with Ronald Knox, who, who writes this article, in some sense, kind of poking fun about, you know, studies in literature, the literature of Sherlock Holmes, and saying, like, if you took um, what we call, like, a new critical study and, like, analyzed Sherlock Holmes stories um, as if they were kind of real, what would you learn about literary studies? And this kind of kicks this off. Um, the Baker Street Irregulars create a journal um, where people can publish some of their kind of great game um, articles. People like, you know, William Baring Gould um, published an, an authorized, you know, biography of Sherlock Holmes. You know, not a, you know, nothing fictional about this, right? Here's the real biography, the background of this character, and there's lots of other elements of that too. Um, and one of the things like that I love is that, you know, Dorothy L. Sayers, who the, the great 1930s uh, mystery writer in England, who was very much a part of this, and, and she wrote like the, the golden rules of mystery and detective fiction, and she says, you know, the game has to be played with as solemnly as a county cricket match at Lord's the slightest touch of extravagance or burlesque ruins the atmosphere. So this is absolutely real, and everything they're doing is very serious. And this continues, this practice continues on to this day. I was telling a friend of mine, you know, when I teach Sherlock Holmes, my students will go off and, you know, and, and, and pull up research, and then they'll, they'll find all the stuff from the Baker Street Journal, which is indexed by my university, and they're like, look at all this stuff I found. Is this real? You know, like, did Sherlock Holmes really do this? And like, to try to explain to a college student about what the great game is and how it works is a bit challenging. One of the other things that was really integral to those first um, Sherlock Holmes societies is that they were really invested kind of in um, the, the materiality of Sherlock Holmes and um, kind of the arcana associated with that character very early on. So they started collecting um, Arthur Conan Doyle material, um, editions, manuscripts very early on. You know, in one piece of research I found that, you know, I was just looking at handwritten manuscript pages of the Hound of the Baskervilles upstairs, right? Which is, you know, went to auction, you know, I'll talk about that in the next slide. The last time one page of that went to auction, how much it went for. Um, but one gentleman started buying up um, Doyle manuscripts as early as 1918. He would donate his manuscript pages or manuscripts for charity events so people could raise money. He didn't think they were worth that much. And already by 1918, you know, even he's still writing the stories, you've got, um, records of, of collectors starting to collect. Like we had, um, one collector had already owned 10 Conan Doyle manuscripts at that point. So people started collecting these. Um, we talked about a study in Scarlet, um, which they have a Beaton's Annual upstairs. There's only known to be 11 of these complete Beaton's Annuals with the very first Sherlock Holmes stories in existence in the world today. If you go and look at it, you can see it's like a Reader's Digest. You know, it would, that, that would perish very easily or become you know, kindling for a fire. Um, the last one that went for sale, most of them are in um, different archives, like the University of Minnesota's, which is the one that we have upstairs. There's archives in um, Portsmouth, England as well. Um, the last one that went up for auction in 2004 sold for $156,000. Um, some collectors say it's the most expensive magazine in the entire world because it's worth so much money for collectors. Um, the other things we can talk about there is the Sidney Paget illustration. So I've, I've used this one earlier, this very iconic 
illustration that the um, original illustrator of the Strand Magazine drew for Holmes and Moriarty going off the Reichenbach Falls, um, that went for auction also in 2004 for $220,000. They have a Sydney Pageant upstairs, <laughs> an illustration. They're just eight by 10 pen and ink drawings, but the last one about 15, 16 years ago, as I said, sold for about a quarter of a million dollars. And then the most recent one, this is one page from the Hound of the Baskervilles original manuscript. Doyle broke that manuscript up into different pieces. It was sold off. This one actually went to auction last year in 2021, and it sold for almost $500,000. It's one page of his handwriting. This was a good investment for whoever that person was because they said the last time it actually went up for sale in 2012, it sold for about this one page, about 150,000. So he quadrupled his investment in 10 years. So they're becoming very scarce um, and very hard to get your hands on. Um, but it's a, it's a big business. And so I always tell people, you know, when I give talks, I'm like, go in your attics, go to your grandma's house. Like, you know, does she have any old, you know, magazines or newspapers? They're worth a lot of money, but they have Sherlock Holmes in them. Um, and so I mentioned, you know, most of these, most of the, um, of the Sherlock Holmes um, memorabilia really was being um, started to be collected early 20th century by a lot of these Sherlock Holmes aficionados, members of, of Scion societies like the Baker Street Irregulars, one of whom was uh, John Bennett Shaw, who had this fantastically large collection. Um, and then, you know, he donated, made a private donation of a majority of his collection to the University of Minnesota, um, where you can see oh, um, many, 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 many items. It's open to the public, but you have to make um, um, reservations with them to go ahead and do it. Many of their items, of course, are upstairs in the exhibit here, which is really fantastic to be able to see because they're very, very rare. Um, they have more than 60,000 items um, related to Sherlock Holmes at the University of Minnesota. Um, it's considered the lo world's largest um, archive of Sherlock Holmes and Arthur Conan Doyle memorabilia anywhere in the world. Um, I've been worked at the Portsmouth um, City Library, the Richard Lancelin Green, um, and they have something like 17,000 items, which is a lot to catalog as well. Um, you can go there, as I mentioned, they do wonderful presentations. You can see reconstructions of um, the Baker Street, you know, 221B Baker Street living room. You can see, you know, all the different kind of influences that they've had um, in um, pop culture in particular as well, which has been really fascinating to look at over the, the last century. This is where, I mentioned Philip Brogdon a little earlier as the, the first black American inducted to the Baker Street Irregular. Um, regulars. And this is one of the things that um, contributions that he made, which is just so substantial and not, has not yet really gotten enough um, attention. He was a collector too and was really um, well known for collecting kind of black mystery stories, you know, stories in America and around the world that featured black detectives and black mysteries. Um, back um, in the late 20th century, he actually, you know, had a whole article about, written about him in the Washington Post. He was a DC resident and his collection of something like, I don't even remember, like, you know, how many things he had. Um, he had a special exhibit at the Martin Luther King Jr. Library just on his um, collection on black detectives. In particular, he was really fascinated with black, black Sherlock Holmes adaptations. So um, he collected, you know, independently published, you know, adaptations. So he had a couple of these on um, Deadlock Holmes, which was kind of a, a new incarnation. And he published um, mo a lot of his work in a, a small little pamphlet, which was really, um, really published by the bootmakers, um, um, Sherlock Holmes Society in Toronto in connection with the Toronto Metropolitan Library. It really is like um, card stock and photocopy paper and stapled together. Um, I was able to get a copy of that. I saw, I, you know, first time I ever came across this was in 2014 in the Portsmouth Archive, and I thought, I've never seen this kind of material before. And it has everything in it from, you know, he does a bio of himself, you know, and why he's a prominent kind of Sherlockian. He has different adaptations and versions of Sherlock Holmes or references to Sherlock Holmes within African American culture and kind of um, African culture worldwide, like the Deadlock Holmes stories that he has there. He looks at um, everything from different kind of plays or stories that came out. So um, this was an adaptation, a theater adaptation for children 
um, that was done in London that had a young um, black female um, playing the John Watson part. Um, and then he would have people who were, you know, there was a university tenant. <laughs> Good grief, those watches, I tell you. They really are listening to you. <laughs> um, a University of Tennessee basketball player whose first name was Sherlock because his mom was a big fan, right? Um, so there's this wonderful collection of media, television, film, theater, um, people who basically represent, uh, you know, African American and internationally, you know, African identified people with the Sherlock Holmes character over the last 100 plus years. And it's a really important contribution to kind of the history of this character and different versions of it with an audience that has not typically been represented. And so he's really done some kind of a really interesting way of um, a particular fam bring, bringing his own um, uh, you know, identity to Sherlock Holmes and finding himself in that as well. Now, how are we doing on time? I got a lot to go through. <laughs> so we're only at, we're in the middle, right? We're at 1950s. This is pretty short. So, um, so in 19, so we've talked kind of already about early fandom. We've talked about um, the Sherlock Holmes societies. In 1951, um, the UK created a kind of national, I would think in many ways it's like think of it as a world's fair, except focus particularly on Britain itself. This is post-World War II. Um, the, the country was um, financially bankrupt, really economically depressed, still going through food rationing at this point, trying to recover from World War II. And the government decided they really wanted to celebrate Britishness um, in particular, um, didn't include anything about the Commonwealth or really about other places in the world, and talked about really celebrating the nation. And one of the ways that they wanted to, they identified that they wanted to celebrate Britishness was to actually acknowledge the contribution of Sherlock Holmes. And so they created a, a reconstruction of 221B Baker Street and Sherlock Holmes' sitting room um, at the Abbey National Bank and Baker Street, where people could come and see, much like, how many of you have seen the exhibit so far? So we've got a little bit of a reconstruction upstairs, right? So a lot of those kinds of elements that you can actually see from this promotional photo um, from the 1950s. And so you see this is where you know, Sherlock Holmes would have sat, and here's his violin. They have his Persian slipper up on the mantle where he kept his tobacco. They had you know, the stuffed um, half torso that he used in the adventure of the empty house to trick Sebastian Moran into believing he was assassinating him, and all the different memorabilia that you could see in Sherlock Holmes's you know real sitting room. Remember, he's a fictional character, but this was so identified with with part of British identity even in the 1950s. That was one of the ways that they celebrated their national identity, and thousands of people came to see this exhibit while it was out there. Um, and there's a fantastic video even on YouTube of this two and a half minute kind of black and white video of live footage of people who came to the exhibit and they talked about um, the different elements that they had there and where it was. Now after this was over, um, parts of those exhibit were split up, but a lot of it actually went to the Sherlock Holmes pub, which is in Trafalgar Square. And if you go to the Sherlock Holmes pub and eat upstairs, you can peek through these windows into this mysterious room where you can see the 1951 um, Festival of Britain Sherlock Holmes exhibit in like the real you know, 221B Baker Street. And so what this starts for us is really kind of uh, the origins of fan tourism that you start to see. So you know, this idea that you could go to Sherlock Holmes's house and see his you know, personal things in 1950 and now moves on to contemporary pubs. Now, this actually you know, is something that was not contemporary actually to 1950. Doyle himself said you know, one of the things that most kind of solidified how invested the public was in Sherlock Holmes as a real person was in a story that people told him about a group of boys, coming, French schoolboys, coming over in the English Channel to tour, you know, to be tourists in London, and the first thing they wanted to do was they wanted to go to 221B Baker Street and see where Sherlock Holmes lived. And this is in the 1890s, right? Like, so, you know, young children are, are believing even then that he's a real character. Um, and so they would go to Baker Street, you know, and, and so many people wrote letters um, to Sherlock Holmes as well. There's a fantastic collection by Richard Lancelin Green, this um, British collector, 
where you know he basically worked with um, the Abbey National Bank, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, to collect some of the most unique letters that people would write. Some people clearly were in on the game and would just write fan mail, you know, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I love that adventure of the blue carbuncle, keep up the good work, right? Children would write to him to say, you know, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I've, we've lost our cat Fluffy, can you help us find him? Um, during the Blitz, people wrote to Sherlock Holmes to help them defeat the Nazis, and people continued on um, for you know, decades um, writing for Sherlock Holmes for help. Now, probably the, the most interesting part of, of Sherlock Holmes fan tourism, of course, is that thousands of fans every year come to 221B Baker Street to view um, Sherlock Holmes' um, place of uh, you know, residence. You can, right next door is the Sherlock Holmes Museum. You can go walk in 221B, you buy your ticket in the museum, you go upstairs, and you can see all of the elements, again, of Sherlock Holmes' um, lifestyle as he lived there. Um, I've been several times. John Watson is alive and well. I just want to let you know you can get your picture taken with him. I think he looks fantastic for being about 165 years old. Um, and again, like all around that picture, you can see so much of the paraphernalia. You know, we've got the Persian slipper again. We've got his violin and his chemistry equipment. And you can see all of that. And part of, of course, what's so fun about it is above the door to 221B, there's this blue plaque. Now, I live in New England now. We have plaques like that all the time. You know, Nathaniel Hawthorne died here in Plymouth, New Hampshire. People don't know that. You know, Paul Revere lived here. You know, these things. These are historical markers, right? And right above the wonderful door at 221B Baker Street is a wonderful marker that says, Sherlock Holmes consulting detective lived here, right? <laughs> From 1881 to 1904. Now, the fun thing about Baker Street is that in uh, 1887, when Conan Doyle originally created Sherlock Holmes, um, the houses on Baker Street only numbered up to 100. So there was no 221 Baker Street. So it wasn't until 1930 when the city of Westminster extended Baker Street that 221 Baker Street became a reality, and it was the home of the Abbey National Bank, this boring bank. And as soon as that bank you know, opened their doors, they're the ones who started receiving mail addressed to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> They received so many letters addressed to Sherlock Holmes that they had to hire a professional secretary whose job title was secretary to Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and she personally responded to every piece of fan mail that came in, thanked them for writing. Unfortunately, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson were away on a case and couldn't help them, but they would forward them. They were still receiving 200 to 300 letters per week all the way until the 1990s. So what happens in the 1990s? Well, in the 1990s, this wonderful private museum decides to open down the street at 239 Baker Street. Westminster City Council says, gosh, this is going to be great for tourism. We're going to make a ton of money. We're going to bring all those people into the region. This is going to be fantastic. And they said, but you know, it's really kind of a bummer that we've got this great museum down at 229. 239 Baker Street and this boring bank that's at 221. So they renumbered the street. <laughs> so if you go to Baker Street today and you look actually at the numbers, you'll see 235, 237, 221B, 241, and you're like, wait, wait a minute. But that's where all the people are, right, looking up. Um, so, you know, this fan tourism is something that, you know, continues to be a fascinating part of, of the way that fans engage with this character. So the Sherlock Holmes Society of London um, got all dressed up in Victorian um, costumes and in 1968 flew to Switzerland and reenacted the final problem of the great battle between Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty and their death over the Reichenbach Falls. They did this every year. Um, on May 5th to kind of celebrate and commemorate that as well. And then BBC Sherlock fandom is really engaged and interested. Lots of fans have published pictures of, of course, Speedy's Cafe, which is allegedly just downstairs from our um, BBC Sherlock as well. And they go around um, and take pictures of different um, sites, the St. Bart's Hospital, where Watson and Holmes meet for the very first time. Some fans even travel and meet some of the actors, maybe, back in 2011, right? I was there to see a play, I swear. First time I've ever done a stage door. 
So when we get to kind of the contemporary moment, and you see a lot of new kind of a rebirth and new interest in younger people, and particularly in Sherlock Holmes, and all of the different um, incarnations that we have. And you see an, a new resurgence of different kinds of ways that young people are making Sherlock Holmes their own and interacting with different versions of them, and really kind of engaging with and living in what we call it as a participatory culture. So, so what's a participatory culture? Well, participatory cultures are ones that engage people to actually participate in um, the uh, storytelling and kind of the world and the lore and the control of the story. So there's, it's very easy, especially with the internet, to be able to interact with other people um, who are interested in things that you are um, in order, and also be able to use the things that you're passionate about to kind of increase or improve civic engagement um, or as a form of activism on things. Um, think about um, gender and sexual identity or you know, changing kind of representation in, in television, film, and different kinds of media. Um, it's a very creative kind of market right now. You know, I had examples, we're gonna look at a couple. Fan art, videos, fan fiction, um, costume play, role playing, all kinds of different ways for people to um, enact and engage with um, their stories and their favorite characters in really interesting and creative ways. Um, there's a lot of mentorship that happens between really experienced fans and people who are new. Um, there's a free exchange of knowledge um, and expertise across the different kind of digital environments as well. Um, they believe that their, their contributions matter, that they're um, expanding and enlarging the the representation and the interactions that more people can have with something that they're, they love. Um, and they really can build um, really strong relationships, social relationships with people. Um, that 221 Beacon, which, you know, which I have again back here, are people who you know, may have been friends on the internet for, for years and then meeting up together you know, at these different kind of conferences and engagements all around the country. Now these creative people are dealing with all kinds of different Sherlock Holmes, not just the you know, their more recent ones. So you have some people who really express themselves through um, art, whether it's drawing, um, digital illustration, pencil, and they're looking at lots of different um, Sherlock Holmes fandoms. So you know, we have people who are imagining their own kind of pencil creations of the original Arthur Conan Doyle version. Um, you've got people doing fantastic cartoons of Johnny Lee Miller, um, and um, all of a sudden I forgot Jones. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, character cartoons with them together, Jude Law, and then of course, you know, you've got BBC Sherlock um, as well. And so playing with different scenes and references and also putting them in, in new environments and situations. For some people, kind of drawing is, is not enough and they really want to kind of enact what we call cosplay, which is costume play. So they want to you know, go out and say like, I wanna to try to be the character and, and how much can they approximate the look of their um, favorite characters. And you've got everything here from people doing their um, own interpretations of what Holmes or Watson could look like, a Victorian one. You've got steampunk Holmes. You've got children dressing up that way. Um, people kind of in the classic Basil Rathbone, you know, Deerstalker and Inverness Cloak, um, BBC Sherlock, Robert Downey Jr. And then, of course, this picture, which is a Guinness Book of World Records, it was the largest kind of, you know, Sherlock Holmes impersonation gathering together where they had hundreds of people come dressed as Holmes, who, as you all know, never wore a Deerstalker, right? Um, or smoked a Meerschaum pipe. Um, some people, you know, kind of doing costume plays. Some of them, I, you know, I don't know, I gotta keep going. The ones in the top right, those are some of the best BBC Sherlock cosplayers. Those are the, are two women. They've hired professional photographers and like pose and reenacted scenes from the television show. It's just fantastic the investment people will put into um, working on these. Um, for some people, you know, cosplay is kind of one way for them to, um, um, role play with those characters. There's a lot of fans who go on the internet and write live action kind of writing role playing together, um, which I talk about in my book. And so you see this in lots of different formats. Now when, when BBC was um, being broadcast on television, you know, back in about 2014, I found over 40 different people had Sherlock Holmes, BBC Sherlock in particular, Sherlock Holmes role play 
persona characters on Facebook alone. There was over 40 of them um, having different, different interactions, and they would have other people playing different characters, and then would create dialogues together as well. They were on Tumblr. They were on lots of different um, platforms as well. But probably the biggest place where contemporary fans are really kind of, especially young fans, are really engaging with Sherlock Holmes is through that um, realm of fan fiction. So Archive of Our Own is a, um, a web-based um, fan fiction creation and sharing site. It's the most popular um, fan fiction site on the internet right now. And if you just go on and look for Sherlock Holmes fan fiction, you can find all different kinds of, so you've got, you know, the all Sherlock Holmes related fandoms, but there's people writing Arthur Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes fan fiction, elementary Sherlock Holmes fan fiction, BBC, Robert Downey Jr., different kinds of fan fictions. So much so that if you put it all together, we've got something like, this is, I did this maybe a month ago, over 144,000 independent fan fiction. Some of them are hundreds of thousands of words long. People writing their own stories, their own pastiches and fan fictions, which can be everything from being, you know, filling kind of in story gaps of the television show. They can be fantastical that, you know, Sherlock Holmes is an alien with tentacles. You know, my, some of my favorites are alternate universes. Like, what if Sherlock Holmes was an American high-speed baseball pitcher in a high-speed baseball team? And Watson is a catcher, and they go to the World Series. <laughs> you know, things that you would think had nothing like that. But hundreds of thousands of, of, of fan fictions written about all different kind of incarnations of Sherlock Holmes. Now, like, what does this mean in comparison to all of the fan fiction that's on Archive of Our Own? And, you know, this is actually a research study from, I think it's 2020, um, where they looked at the most written about Sherlock, um, most written about fan fictions on the web. And I think number one and number four should cancel each other out. You have the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and then you have the Avengers, which is Mar Marvel's too. But Sherlock, the BBC Sherlock, by itself, is something like the seventh or eighth most written about tell, you know, media franchise in all of fan fiction, the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of fan fictions that are being written about right now. And this, you know, like I said, like, um, you know, I'll talk about, so this is really what I look at in my book is that not only why are fans so interested in and obsessed with that BBC Sherlock version, you know, it's the most popular on, among fans right now, um, but my, my kind of starting point question was, well, yeah, but if they love the TV show so much, why do they keep wanting to change it, <laughs> right? Like, why are we writing about them as baseball players? You know, why are we writing about them as aliens? You know, why are we writing about them in you know, these particular ways? And, and, and what I kind of conclude is, is that there's a specific sense of this Sherlockian world that the creators of the BBC um, television show establish that you'll find in all of those fan fictions. You know, the, their characters speak and have a syntax just like the characters on the TV show do. They reference material objects in 221B. You know, they'll talk about speedies. They'll talk about those particular characters, and you find those elements over and over again. And that goes all the way back to Arthur Conan Doyle as well, because those things are all grounded in the world that Arthur Conan Doyle created in the original Sherlock Holmes stories. Now, right before I conclude, you know, there's sort of like, wow, and there's just so many ways fans have engaged with this particular character. You know, they've written pastiches. You know, they wrote Sherlock Holmes stories when Doyle was still alive, right? You know, they took Sherlock Holmes and they put him in advertising without Arthur Conan Doyle's permission. He was in comics. You know, people were doing tourism. There are all these things around him. Why is that? What's so special about Sherlock Holmes that allowed all of these people to engage with this character in a particular way? And one of the big keys about this character is the role of copyright or the absence thereof. Doyle, you know, even upstairs in, in the exhibit, laments that you know, when he first publishes you know, Study in Scarlet, he sold it outright for 25 pounds. You know, he did not copyright 
that particular story. When he went and allowed people to publish his stories in the United States, he didn't have copyright protection of those. And you know, any of you who followed kind of you know some of the the, the Sherlock Holmes and copyright sagas over the last you know 10, 15 years, you'll know this is a kind of a, a continuing debate among many people and the Arthur Conan Doyle estate about that role of of copyright. So I would say like if you look at a hundred years from now, are we going to see the same proliferation of fan fiction, pastiche, comic, advertising, with a character like Harry Potter, you know, who's the biggest you know, global phenomenon of a fictional character in a century. And we won't, because Warner Brothers, who owns the copyright of Harry Potter, if they see you publicly write the name Harry Potter somewhere, they're going to send you a cease and desist letter and, and threaten you with a, a lawsuit. Um, because they have that control of that copyright. And so, you know, but, but the Sherlock Holmes character kind of keeps um, living on there. So um, the last thing, so let's talk about some conclusions real quick here. So, you know, I think fan engagement, you know, one of the reasons why that Sherlock Holmes has remained so popular and so appealing to so many people is that, you know, he's still around because we're still around. Like fan engagement and the way that we've interacted with his character is unique. And it's something that keeps bringing Sherlock Holmes um, back to new audiences worldwide. Um, participatory culture, though, even though we love to think of it not new. You know, we go back and we look at the 1890s and we see audiences, readers and responders reacting and interacting with Sherlock Holmes in exactly the same ways and very similar ways that we see today. So people were participating in Sherlock Holmes fandom in the 1890s as well as they were in the 1990s. Um, when we talk about participatory culture, we don't really mean historically when we look at it, that it was actually everybody was invited, right? Participatory, when we look at the history, did, does not mean and did not mean that it was open to all. Only certain kinds of people were invited into a lot of these special societies. And it's very, very recent that women or people of color were included or even acknowledged as having kind of any kind of representation in this fan phenomenon and this world of Sherlock Holmes. And kind of lastly, you know, I think that also points to where we need to be going in the 21st century. We have to be paying more attention to, you know, difference and inclusivity and including more broader perspectives on like who Sherlock Holmes is, what his history is, and what he means to different people around the world. And so, you know, part of some of the work I'm hoping to do in the next year or a couple of years is, is, is changing that history and talking about how um, different versions, black Sherlock Holmes in particular in America, go back historically almost as old as Sherlock Holmes do, back until about 1902, and then they continue on today. There, is a, there are more histories there than the story that we've been telling. So thank you, and we'll stop there and see if you have any questions. Sorry for going a little over. Sherlock doesn't seem to be too particularly um, interested in women, mm -hmm. and except for you know his housekeepers in the in the picture, he lived with a man. Mm -hmm. So my question is, was he gay? Mm -hmm. What are There's your thoughts? All kinds of fantastic stories about that. Um, what we always have to remember with the original stories is they're always filtered through Watson, right? So um, what you're getting is Watson's interpretation of Sherlock Holmes and Watson's perceptions of Sherlock Holmes. Watson is notoriously girl crazy, right? Um, which I also love in the for Nigel Bruce's, which who is like so not Arthur Conan Doyle's Watson, um, but I I love. Um, you know, kind of even his um, bumbling with women. So, and what Watson tells us, right, right from the beginning, he says, yeah, you know, like Holmes doesn't have any interest in women. In particular, Holmes isn't interested in love. He's, he says he's not emotional and that Holmes views emotion as something that's antithetical to his work, right? That's gonna be, it's gonna be interfering. Um, Stephen Moffat and Mark Gatiss, who created the BBC Sherlock, say that's ridiculous. Like they say, he's an incredibly emotional character. He does react emotionally, especially to 
Um, he's very protective of women, actually. You know, so um, if you know a young woman comes, like in a case of identity, you know, and her stepfather and her mother are conspiring to create a fake boyfriend for her, so that she won't get married and move out and take her money, <laughs> and so they get her, you know, engaged to essentially, which is their stepfather, but in disguise, and he makes her promise she'll, if something happens to him, he'll, she'll always wait and she'll never leave. Um, and Holmes is so angry about them tricking her that, you know, he threatens to attack him, you know, he's going to beat him, and it's, you know, by Jove, somebody needs to stand up for this girl if she doesn't have a brother or father to do it for him. So he seems very protective of women sometimes, but he'll also make incredibly sexist comments to say, you know, you know, don't disillusion a woman if she thinks something, you know, don't correct her because she'll attack you like a tiger, right? She, she doesn't want to, you know, she wants to live in her disillusionment. So I, I don't know, you know, if I see enough evidence in the original stories to see that whether they're, he's gay, whether they're in a queer relationship together, Watson is incredibly adoring of Holmes, you know, um, even half the time he's like, even though he's married, he's like, yeah, I'm just, I'm decided I was going to spend the night for like three nights at Baker Street, you know, he like hangs up um, back with him quite a bit. So I'm not sure I've seen um, a lot of that uh, in the original stories, but it's something that lots of fans, of course, in the 20th century have really speculated about, right? Oh, I know, yeah, I know, exactly, like, that's my heart, too. I'm like, yes, <laughs> secretly, yes. In my, you know, in my head canon, John Watson and Sherlock Holmes are madly in love together, right? You know, um, and, and this comes up in movies like The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, right? Um, there's other early um, um, Sherlockian great game scholarship that actually proposes that Watson was a woman, um, that she, he wasn't a guy, and he was like, you know, you know, engaging, you know, a transgender person, basically, you know, enacting in the world like it was a, a man, but they were hiding this relationship that they had together, um, even though that wouldn't make, you know, Sherlock Holmes queer. So, um, but it's definitely kind of the current moment. I mean, we now look back and say, are there these pieces? Um, so, Holmes, one last thing, and I know I'm, I'm beating a dead horse now. Holmes is very frightened of domesticity, which is another thing. So he's incredibly afraid of like what happens in a domestic household between women and men, especially like if you're out in the country. He always thinks like people are so scared of London and they think it's this, you know, cesspool of criminality. He's like, go out into the countryside, all these houses by themselves. He's like, you don't have any idea what's going on in there, you know? And there's this great image of one of the stories where he says to Watson, you know, if, if if you and I, hand in hand, could fly out this window and peek in at all the windows and see, he says, the queer goings on inside all of these, you know, heteronormative households, you'd be shocked, right? Um, and so that's kind of a really fascinating kind of Peter Pan-like reference of, of the two of them together, too. Yeah. Did fandom play a particular role in convincing movie theaters and government organizations to tap into Holmes as a uh, tool, well, not tool, but vehicle for wartime propaganda, you mm -hmm. know, the Basil mm -hmm. Rathbone visiting Washington. Mm -hmm. But yeah. were, there, were there particular people in government who were, if Gosh. you will, fans that yes. helped to move that along? I mean, I would say, like, absolutely. I mean, I would say, yes, were there particular people in government who were fans? Very prominent people were often... Um, a big Sherlock Holmes fan. But I'm like, I love that idea, and I feel like someone should write that book. <laughs> you know, um, I don't have the evidence yet to see if there was some intentional use of his character. Um, and I haven't actually myself seen examples of, in England, like, for example, of wartime propaganda. Like, you know, like we have Uncle Sam, you know, like, you know, we want you. And there's fantastic collections um, of, at the Imperial War Museum on... Um, World War One and World War Two propaganda. Um, you can buy little fantastic postcard reproductions of, you know, don't this woman who basically has a skull head and it's basically like don't get VD, you know. Um, so there's some fantastic ones um, that are out there, but I've never seen him used 
that way. Um, but there's a, there's a whole field I could have gone into and talked about that also just looked at the role that he plays in advertising. So he gets used, like we talked about, 1892. This is before he's even killed off. And he's being appropriated to sell aspirin. Um, and there's some examples upstairs. One of the weirdest ones is like in the 1930s, Clive Brook was an actor who played Sherlock Holmes in some early silent films. Um, and um, the Otis Elevator Company used a, a photo of him as Sherlock Holmes to sell what they called a new detective service. So you know when you're in an elevator and you can hit the button for the alarm? That's what they're selling in this magazine ad. But they're associating Sherlock Holmes with it. And you see Sherlock Holmes selling um, oranges and gin. And I mean, upstairs, there's some really fantastic kind of different examples. One was for dog food. Um, so he gets, I mean, you try to figure out what the association is, but I've never seen, actually, whether it's in the United States, any kind of propaganda or in the UK that used him. One of the coolest things I saw at the Portsmouth archive was there was this um, big marketing and sales company who created this whole training package for their salespeople to come in that was all based on Mycroft Holmes. It was like this, I thought, this is like a whole creative writing experiment that like there's this whole folder packet that you would get as part of your training materials and it was like Mycroft Holmes was the one who was like bringing you into this you know fraternity of salespeople for this corporation um, there's greeting cards you know there's the, I don't get like why he's associated with peanuts you know there's a Woodstock Sherlock Holmes upstairs um, in England they have a Snoopy a, a Woodstock Snoopy lamp um, which I'm like why you know um, so there's all kinds of different versions, but I've never actually seen it. But the government question is a good one. Got time for maybe one more question, if anyone's got you. I'm happy to answer any later, but we won't keep you. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really interested in your sort of naive belief um, concept, the th uh, through line there. And I was interested because certainly with sort of the great game, you have these people who are perfectly aware that Sherlock Holmes is a fictional character, but are, with the sort of Dorothy L. Sayers quote, are, are treating it very seriously and creating yeah. sort of fan works of their own in some ways. And then you talked about the sort of post-season two finale BBC Sherlock, mm -hmm. um, and that is also sort of a, a, you know, fan art, fan creation that mm -hmm. everyone was, was in on it, mm -hmm. that they were, you know, that not to discount the, the real emotional sort of toll yeah. of that episode, yeah. but that people were, were doing this as a sort yeah. of work of fan creation. Mm -hmm. And so going back to what you were talking about at the beginning of the presentation about these newspaper articles and the interviews with Holmes and, and things like that, mm -hmm. I mean, to me, they, they read as very sort of tongue in cheek, oh, the yeah. Oliver Wendell Holmes or whatever. Yes. <laughs> Is there any way that you know of or any evidence you've come across to sort of understand um, how people react, wrote and reacted to those sort of interviews and things at the time. Certainly we can look back now and, and interpret them the way we interpret them today, mm -hmm. but have you run across anything that tells, gives you indi any indication of how people took those things in, in the 1890s? Yeah, um, and most of my research, I mean, it's just hard to find this stuff, you know, because, you know, Titbits in particular, where, you know, Titbits in, in the UK and, which was, which, you know, the, the Strand Magazine was, was marketed toward middle class families, um, and Titbits was kind of a, a newspaper toward more, more working class. So they had some overlapping audiences, but they were kind of um, supposed to be geared toward different groups. Um, and Titbits is not digitally archived, you know, so a lot of the research that I found and I published on um, was literally from newspaper clippings, um, a lot of them from Richard Lancelin Green's collection in, at Ports, in Portsmouth, um, where, you know, his goal was he wanted to own or have, he was independently wealthy, every single thing that was ever connected to Sherlock Holmes. Um, and so, you know, he would find old newspapers and he would clip out things. And, um, and when I went there, that stuff was not even cataloged. This is 2014. Um, they didn't even have it cataloged. They don't even know what they had. They would have boxes, shirt boxes, of newspaper clippings. They were like, we know this has something to do with Sherlock Holmes between 1890 and 1899. <laughs> so I was like, okay, you know, I'd start going through stuff and see what I found. 
Um, so, um, so I found that, and there's, a, there's one scholar who's done a lot of research on what they call the new journalism, um, and, this, and the, um, the editor and, and owner of, of Titbits, George Nunes, um, and his role in that. So, um, and she had done some more archive research. And so I don't have kind of the reaction to that. In the United States, there's a, the, kind of a parallel to that was the Bookman. Um, and they had a lot of, you know, there's like letters to the editor, inquiry columns, um, pastiches, what they were invite people in um, to write about things. Um, they were actually uh, following along the serialization of The Hound of the Baskervilles, and they would, the editors and the audiences would speculate about like, how is it going to end, and what do you think it is? And they would write in, and they would have their theories, and then of course, you know, they'd read it and they'd write that. Um, so there's clearly, elements and, and titbits, and like we talked about with some of those fake interviews, that they absolutely know this is a tongue-in-cheek thing, right? The content of them tell you, you know, it's, it's tongue-in-cheek. Um, and even some of those fake obituaries do that. So, so there's that element that people knew what they were doing and creating. But what I found was it was more on the media side, you know? So it was like, it was the editors who were writing those interviews, and it was the newspapers who were um, how they were responding back to fans. So I can't, I can't tell, you know. Um, Michael Saylor, I mentioned him. He's the one who came up with that kind of phrase, naive believers. He's got a fantastic book, which is called, oh shoot, like disenchantment, enchantment, as if, is what it's called, it's like as if colons, like disenchantment and modernism. And so he talks about kind of this rise of like, you know, logic and at the same time this rise of kind of wanting to re remain and kind of, uh, it embracing fantasy life and fantasy world at the beginning of you know, the 20th century. Um, so it's hard, right, to find out um, what the people who were actually were writing in were doing, right? Um, the letters I mentioned, that um, Richard Lancel and Green's um, collection of Sherlock letters is another one where I think you can tell, you know, when it's a child that, you know, they believe, right? And you can tell sometimes in those tones of those letters who's playing the game um, and who, you know, and, and is trying to like wink, wink, you know, like I know that, you know, we're, we're playing like he's real. And other people who were just like, I don't know where to send a letter to tell this guy who writes these stories that I like his stuff, you know? Um, so it's a great question. And it's like, so how do you, you know, it's the, one of the hardest questions in literary studies is how do you know the intent, let alone the intent of the public? who's writing under a pseudonym. Uh, yeah, I, I, so I don't, I don't have enough evidence to be able to answer, other than sometimes the text itself. Well, if only they had public survey forms back then. That's right, I know, exactly. Feedback forms. Join me in giving Anne McClellan another round of applause for a terrific presentation. Thank you so much for coming out, and thank you, Anne, for being here. Um, I'm sure if you have more questions, she'd be willing to talk with you after. If you do have those surveys, we'd love you to fill them out. Don't forget to put your name in the fishbowl for a thing, and you can just leave the completed surveys up there on the table. Thanks so much. Spread the word. we got more Sherlock-themed programming coming up, uh, so keep an eye on our website, and there's a little fly out there for the, the most recent ones that are coming up. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>